The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and shit. Ah, welcome to Browse High. There are certain stories that filmmakers love to come back to over and over again, partly because they can endlessly enchant, partly because there are so many ways to interpret them, and partly because they're in the public domain. Such is the case with Alice in Wonderland. When Charles Dodson took up the name Lewis Carroll to pen his silly little story about a girl named Alice in 1865, he had no idea just how many artists would try to put their own spin on it, let alone how many times it would be adapted to film. There's the Disney version, the musical version, three silent versions, the 3D overblown multi-million dollar fanfic version, and on, and on, and on. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons, and they all illuminate something new about the original Lewis Carroll text. Then there's this version. It's called Nietzsche the Alenki, or just Alice to English-speaking markets. The creation of Czech director Jan Svankmeyer. It's a mixture of live action and stop motion animation. And considering that Jan Svankmeyer is one of the leading artists in the medium, I am really looking forward to this one. It begins rather pastorally, with the young Alice, played by Czech actress Kristina Kohadova, sitting by the brook near an older woman. It's an opening that reminds us Alice thought to herself. That's odd. Now you will see a film. Very odd. You must close your eyes. Otherwise, you won't see anything. Okay, if you say so. Am I missing anything? I don't think this eye closing thing is working. Should have kept my eyes closed. I don't know what's the scariest thing about this rabbit. The bug eyes, the bright sharp teeth, the fact that he's wielding scissors and knows how to use them. Or perhaps it's his giant, constantly bleeding sawdust chest wound that he uses as a briefcase. Dear, oh dear, I shall be late, said the white rabbit. Of course, Alice's repeated attempts to swallow the camera lens aren't making me feel any safer. The rabbit makes its way to a wasteland and into a desk showing that we're quietly leaving the real world behind. Alice, for reasons that I cannot comprehend, follows him. Ow. And in this version of the story, her journey actually causes her to shed blood. We are not safe. And again, not helped by a scene that reminds me of that toilet from Train Spotting. <laughs> Dear, how late it's getting, sighed the white rabbit. Oh, that's gonna get real old, said the internet reviewer. Now, one thing that puzzled me here is the director's decision to have her go down the rabbit hole twice. The first time through the desk, and the second time by the Super Mario tube. Then again, this is Alice, and this isn't supposed to make sense. Like this jar full of earwax or something. It's not supposed to make sense. It's just there. Or this pile of leaves she lands in. Not supposed to make sense. It's just there. Well, alright, there is a bit of logic to it. Sotmeyer has Alice fall asleep in her attic. And so everything that she sees, characters, imagery, are all supposed to represent bits and bobs that she would find in someone's attic. If that someone was a taxidermist. Who has a hole in his roof. And keeps a jar of his own earwax. Yeah, maybe it's jam. But now that she's here, we start getting into that whole business of getting the door open. You know, with the key and the desk and eat me and drink me and all that. All to get to the other side of the door, where the rabbit is habitually opening his chest wound and licking his own entrails. Sir, please. Ask yourself this. If you were nine years old, and you saw something make that face at you, would you follow it? Because she wants to follow the reanimated corpse of a bunny, she drinks the ink which turns her into... the Bride of Chucky. I assumed it was just easier to have shrunken Alice be a doll than to have to use trick photography. 
like he does when she grows tall. Huh. Curiouser and curiouser. But again, this is supposed to be a logic- Is the rabbit beating her?! Oh, and he made the little girl cry. But yes, I know the scene was in the book. However, Svankmeyer decided to include this charming scene that was not in the book. Trepanation and lighting small fires on a girl's head. This film is quickly veering into I spit on your grave territory. That's going too far. <laughs> really? I would have drawn the line of getting nails in my head. After eating another biscuit, which shrinks her this time, she washes out, leading her into the next segment, the house of the white rabbit. You remember this part. He mistakes her for someone named Marianne. He tells her to go fetch something from his house. Alice, blah, he stores poop under his mattress. Then she drinks something which makes her grow gigantic. Mary, Mary, so where are those scissors? Demanded the white rabbit. Stop that! Of course, you know, this means war. Ow! Was the original this violent? I mean, everyone remembers the repeated threats of decapitation, but I'm struggling to recall when the rabbit nearly amputated Alice's limbs. This is one of the most cruel... Oh, what fresh hell. It wasn't enough just to have the rat light small fires on her head. He had to sick the legion of the undead on her. And I don't know what's more upsetting. That all of these meatless hell beasts are set to kill Alice, or that Alice actually kills one. But when she gets her hands on another biscuit, she shrinks and tries to sneak out. Now, the original novel made a brief mention of a scene when Alice got chased by the animals. Brief mention. This film turns it into a production number. Everything imaginable, and unimaginable for that matter, comes after her. The rabbit leads the charge with a shining reference, a fish skeleton with legs joins in, then we see what I think is a jester with the skull of a small monkey, at least I hope it's a small monkey, a skeleton duck, and... Oh, come on! Lobsters don't even have skeletons! And now she's trapped in the shell of her former self. A living prison. Are you terrified yet? Alright, I should say something in fairness to the production. I should always be fair. Jan Svankmeyer made this film in communist Czechoslovakia on the eve of the Velvet Revolution, working from a tradition of animation far different from those of us in the States, whose only experience with stop motion came through either Rudolph or Gumby. For one, he built upon tradition of Czech surrealism set by groups like De Vietzel and figures like Taiga and Stierski. Go ahead and pause the video if you want to gaze into these pictures some more. He's also working from a rich tradition of Czech puppetry, complex and stylized and respected across the nation. What you're looking at now is a popular version of Mozart's Don Giovanni, being performed in Prague by an entirely puppet cast. Svankmeyer drew from both of these things to create a uniquely Czech vision of Alice in Wonderland. And I'd be in the wrong to judge it purely on terms that it shouldn't be judged on. That would be insensitive. But that doesn't mean I won't cry when you lock Alice in a closet filled with cockroaches, bread with nails in it, and with slabs of meat or eggs that hatch skulls! I have every right to cry! <gasps> well, at least that rat from before got what was coming to him. Of course, I have no idea what other horrors she might come- Um. Well, she is supposedly imagining her surroundings to be her own wonderland, ergo she imagines the socks to be alive. But, why are the socks so active? Maybe they're all running away from the lonely 12-year-old boys who own them. Wait, this isn't- Said the caterpillar. It is. He doesn't have a hookah, and his mushroom is made of wood, 
and he has teeth that would put Conrad Poos to shame. But yes, this is our caterpillar. Our caterpillar who puts himself to sleep by sewing his own eyes shut. Alice responds to this action quite logically by backing away very slowly. Unfortunately, she backs away from a creepy scene and lands in yet another violent scene. But mainly it's just unsettling at this point. It's not actually scary. Still not the scariest. Oh, one second. Okay. And that was my insightful, well-researched commentary on that scene. If you recall this part of the book, this is where Alice gets to that baby who turns into a pig. And thank all the gods in existence, they used a real breathing pig and not some monstrous stuffed thing on loan from a natural history museum. I should be thankful. I should also be thankful that the Cheshire Cat isn't in this one. I think I got enough serial killer smiles from the caterpillar. She follows the pig, and it leads her into the next scene, which is... No room, no room, no the Tea room, Party. No but in this tea party, the hatter is a marionette made to look like Charles Darwin, and the March Hare is a wind-up toy. Well, why is a raven like a writing desk? Because it can produce a few notes, though they are very flat, and it is never put with the wrong end in front. Someone must have gotten that. Something I'm sure you might have noticed in this movie, besides the jerky, unsettling stop motion, is the sound. There's a disturbing lack of music in each scene. All the dialogue comes from a single voice. Pour yourself a glass of wine, said the Mad Hatter. And in between those ongoing close-ups of a child's mouth, which evokes... Yeah, it feels like that, is a constant clicking and rustling of thousands of inanimate objects. It's omnipresent, but it's most notable in this tea party scene. Every move made is mechanical, wooden, your ears assaulted with the knocking of wood, the rustle of cloth, the stretching of string, the squeaking of wheels, and there's really no respite. The madness of the tea party gets turned into a clockwork parade of monotonous repetition, as if an unseen force guides them to endlessly repeat their illogical progression of consequence and action. Damn it, next scene! The next scene brings us, at last, to the Palace of the Queen of Hearts. And since all of Wonderland's residents have been played by household items, these cards are naturally played by playing cards. This is where the rabbit works. Now off with their heads, said the Queen of Hearts. Do you know why the White Rabbit's been carrying scissors? The White Rabbit is the Lord High Executioner. Yes, all of those attacks and creepy dead-eyed looks were all a build-up to his true and horrible profession. He gets out his scissors and takes more heads than a horny praying mantis. He beheads the hatter and the hare for gambling with members of the royal court. And you know the game of croquet? The one using flamingos and hedgehogs? Shown here using pincushions becoming hedgehogs and flamingos becoming chickens? The cards used in that scene are beheaded too! That's no ordinary rabbit. That's one of the most foul, cruel, bad-tempered rodents you ever laid eyes on. That rabbit's got a vicious stake a mile wide! He's a killer! He can leap about! Look at the bull! I'm quoting Monty Python on the Holy Grail. I should never be that cliché. The climatic scene of the story is, of course, the trial of who stole the tarts. In the original story, it's the knave of hearts who gets put through the ringer. And Alice is only in real trouble when she starts growing too tall. But here, it's Alice who goes on trial for stealing the tarts, and she's only in real trouble when she starts acting demonstrably stupid.
But you can see, the tarts are all here. This, of course, leads to that line. Up with the head! Which leads to Alice being, Ah, yes! Off her head! Off all her head! Kill it! 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 He's late as usual. I think I'll cut his head off. Thought Alice to herself. Well, there it is. After that nightmarish journey into the deepest recesses of stop-motion hell, precocious little Alice has been turned into a sociopathic killer. And that is the most logical reaction she's had in the film. This film is one of the most frightening things ever put on celluloid, and a big part of that is the fact that this film was supposedly meant for children. Every frame holds something unnatural, a strange artificiality that gives everything a taste of the macabre. Add to that a clicking, scratching sound design emphasizing every tiny movement of these creatures, and you create some of the scariest movie monsters ever conceived. And I'd expect no less from a man whose country also produced Kafka. This is in no way a film for children. And it's brilliant! No, really. The unsettling nature of everything shown works to its advantage. Most Alice adaptations make the mistake of getting the audience too comfortable with the setting. In this film, the world genuinely feels topsy-turvy and only bound to its own internal logic. And like the best adaptations, it asks you to find something new in the original text. And I have to value any film that makes me look at something with fresh eyes. And with this inventive staging, I'll never look at cards the same way again. Or dolls. Or socks. Or... Bunnies. Bunnies. Fluffy bunnies. Their fur, matted, their sharp teeth constantly clacking, shaking their foul, unnaturally long ears against their bodies, running so swiftly, constantly clacking of the teeth and their beady little eyes. Hey, young citizen, how's it going? Wow, you got a great place here. Uh, it's really great to be on your show finally. Get back. I swear to God, I'll use this. Huh. Man, you're freaking out. You're kind of freaking out right now, man. Are, are you okay? Me. Are you, oh, Get away from me, demon! Oh, that's kind of rude. Yeah, why don't you just run away like a little girl? That's great. Yep, that's a mature way to handle your problems. Racist. <laughs>